Hi guys, my name is Arya and I welcome you all to this ethical hacking tutorial. So I have a lot to cover and let's get started. Now to begin with, let's look into what exactly is hacking and let's go over a brief introduction to hacking and its different types. So hacking is identifying weaknesses in a computer system or networks to exploit its weaknesses to gain access. An example of hacking is like using a password tracking algorithm to gain access to a target system. Now computers have become mandatory to run a successful business. It is not enough to have isolated computer systems. They need to be networked to facilitate communication with all sorts of external businesses that exist out there. Now this exposes them to the outside world and hacking as a whole. Now hacking means using computers to commit fraudulent acts such as privacy invasion, stealing corporate and personal data, cyber crimes and all sorts of stuff. Now cyber crimes cost many organizations millions of dollars every year and businesses have actually realized the need to protect themselves against such attacks because of the losses that have incurred on their neighboring companies. Now before we go ahead, let me just familiarize you guys with some of the most commonly used terminologies in the hacking world. So firstly, who is a hacker? Now a hacker that you see on your screen is this black person out here. A hacker is a person who finds and exploits the weakness in computer systems and or networks to gain access. Hackers are usually skilled computer programmers with in-depth knowledge of computer security. Now hackers are classified according to the intents of their action. Now the first type of hackers are called white hat hackers. Now a white hat hacker is also known as an ethical hacker. Now this type of hacker is a hacker who gains access to systems with a view to fix the identified weakness. They may also perform sorts of penetration testing and vulnerability assessment. And the most important part to take note about an ethical hacker or a white hat hacker is that they get prior information from the company or the target that they are hacking into. So this is what actually sets them apart from a cracker or a black hat hacker. Now a hacker who gains unauthorized access to computer systems for personal gains. That person is called a black hat hacker. The intent is usually to steal corporate data, violate privacy rights, transfer funds from bank accounts and more such malicious stuff. Then there is also a blend of both called the gray hat hacker. So a gray hat hacker is a hacker who is in between ethical and black hat hackers. He or she breaks into a computer system without authority with a view to identify weaknesses and reveal them to the system owner in return for some bug bounty. So companies like Google, for example, actually put out a lot of bug bounties. Now bug bounties are basically telling the public that you are free to actually find a bug in my system. And if you do so and tell me about it, I will reward you. So that is what a bug bounty is. Now cyber crimes is the use of computers and networks to perform illegal activities such as spreading computer viruses, online bullying and performing unauthorized electronic fund transfers. Most cyber crimes are committed through the internet and some cyber crimes can also be carried out using mobile phones via SMS and online chatting applications. Now there are a bunch of types of cyber crimes which I have actually discussed in my previous video called what is cyber security and what is ethical hacking. So you all can look up that. Now let me just get to the point of explaining what exactly ethical hacking is unless you've already understood it. Now ethical hacking is identifying weaknesses in computer systems and or computer networks and coming with countermeasures that protect the weakness. Now ethical hackers have some goals that they need to meet if they're working for a company. Firstly, they need to protect the privacy of the organizations from being hacked. Secondly, they have to transparently report all the identified weakness in a computer system to the organization. Thirdly, they have to inform hardware and software vendors that are catering to the company of the identified weakness and how they can be patched. So these are the three main goals of an ethical hacker. Now, why is an ethical hacker very important for a company? But firstly, information is one of the most valuable assets of an organization. Keeping information secure can protect an organization's image and save an organization a lot of money. This is because hacking can lead to a loss of business for organizations that deal in finances. For example, PayPal. Now ethical hacking puts them a step ahead of the cyber criminals who would otherwise lead to a loss of business. So basically an ethical hacker would try to mimic a hacker and see what all vulnerabilities that he would find. For suppose PayPal, PayPal has a lot of ethical hackers working for them. So they are constantly trying to find any sort of bugs that might be in their payment gateway, which is actually letting fund being transferred without being validated. So that could be a bug. So an ethical hacker's job is to actually identify that bug and patch it up. 
before any cyber criminal actually finds that bug and uses it for his own malicious intents. Now, the legality of ethical hacking. Now, let me take a moment to actually talk about this topic. Now, ethical hacking is legal if the hacker abides by all the goals that he has to meet that we had just discussed. Now, the International Council of E-Commerce Consultants or the EC Council provides a certification program that tests an individual skill. Those who pass the examinations are awarded with certificates and the certificates are supposed to be renewed after some time. Now, our course at EduReca, that is the ethical hacking course, is completely aligned to the CHV10. So y'all can go ahead and check that out if y'all want to become an ethical hacker, because that will certainly guide you as to how you can achieve that certification. Okay, now moving on. As an ethical hacker, you will be dealing with a bunch of security threats all the time. So it's very necessary that you know what exactly a security threat is and what kind of security threats exist. Now, computer system threat is anything that leads to loss or corruption of data or physical damage to the hardware and or the infrastructure. Knowing how to identify computer security threats is the first step in protecting computer systems. The threats could be intentional, accidental, or caused by natural disaster. Now, in this section, we are going to talk about all sorts of security threats, and we are going to talk about the types of security threats. So what exactly is a security threat? Now, security threat is defined as a risk that can harm or potentially harm a computer system or an organization. The cause could be a physical one, such as someone stealing a computer, or it could be a non-physical one, such as a virus attack. Now, these are the two kinds of threats that are existing out there. It is physical threats and non-physical threats. Now, there are also different kinds of physical threats. Now, let's look into the types of threats. First, it is internal threats. Secondly, it's external threats. And third is human threats. Now, let's go over them one by one. So firstly, let's look at some examples of internal threats. A fire that is inside the system or some unstable power supply or humidity that is actually accumulating and becoming dewdrop somewhere or malfunctioning your system. Then we come to external threats, which include stuff like lightning striking down your house, floods and earthquakes. So these are the types of external threats. So the last kind of threats that we have is human threats. Now human threats include theft or vandalism of the infrastructure or the hardware, disruptions or accidentals and unintentional errors that cause your computer system to malfunction. Now let's move on to non-physical threats. Now, these are the kind of threats you as an ethical hacker will be dealing with much more. So non-physical threats is completely your forte. So non-physical threats include loss or corruption of system data or disruption of business operations that rely on computer systems or the loss of sensitive information. Then non-physical threats can also include illegal monitoring of activities or computer systems then cybersecurity breaches of all sorts and other stuffs like viruses, trojans, worms, spyware, keyloggers, adwares, there's so many other stuff. Even denial of service attacks come under non-physical threats. So basically you get the idea that anything which doesn't have a physical form like a computer virus or worms or a DDoS attack is a non-physical threat. Now to protect an organization against non-physical threats, there are things that you could do. So firstly, as an organization, to protect your computer system from the previously mentioned threats, an organization should have a logical security measure in place. Now, logical security measures could include stuff like antiviruses or cybersecurity measures like some incident response system that you have for your organization for such stuff. Now, to protect yourself against viruses and trojans and worms and all sorts of stuff, an organization can use antivirus softwares. Now, in addition to antivirus software, an organization can also have a control measure on the usage of external storage devices and visiting websites that is most likely to download unauthorized programs onto the user's computer. Thirdly, unauthorized access to computer systems resources can be prevented by the use of authentication methods. And the authentication method can be in the form of user IDs and strong passwords, smart cards, and biometrics of sorts. Last but not the least is the installation of intrusion detection or intrusion prevention systems, that is your IPS and IDS. Now these can be used to protect against denial of service attacks. And there are other measures too that can also be used for denial of service attacks. So these were some of the preventive measures that you should take for non-physical threats. Now it is not necessary for you to become an ethical hacker to take all these preventive measures. 
Now you sitting at home and watching this video can do this actually very simply by just using a virtual private network whenever you're browsing the internet or using a very good antivirus system that you've actually paid for because nothing actually good comes free. Let's remember that. Now I digress and let's move on. Okay, now let's talk about the skills that you would need to become an ethical hacker. So firstly, you need to be good at programming. Now a programming language is a language that is used to develop computer programs. And there are plenty of examples like HTML, JavaScript, Python, PHP, and you should be proficient at quite a few of these. I'll tell you why very soon. So secondly, you should also have a very good and in-depth knowledge of operating systems, especially because you'll be working on Linux mostly if you're an ethical hacker. Now you should know how to go about the command line that exists in Linux and all the bash commands because you'll be extensively using them for your networking purposes. Which brings me to my third point that you should be proficient at networking and should know the ins and out of how a packet actually gets delivered from your computer to a target system. So three things programming operating systems and networking. These are the three things that you will be basically playing around with every day as an ethical hacker. Now many people normally ask what programming languages should I learn if I'm trying to become an ethical hacker. Well, there is no one answer because you will be dealing with a bunch of services. So it would be smart of you as a person pursuing ethical hacking to know at least one example of all the types of languages that exist out there. For example, take HTML. So you could learn HTML for actually knowing how web pages work, which will help you because it's a cross platform language and it is basically good if you're actually targeting web hackers. Now login forms and other data entry methods are used using HTML to get these form types of data. Now you could also learn PHP, which is a great server side language and is widely used over the internet and knowing PHP will actually help you exploit weak PHP code. So if suppose a company has some very weak backend and you as an ethical hacker have to test out their backend, you should be proficient enough to know what the language is doing and where the discrepancies in the code exist because you wouldn't know that if you're not proficient at PHP. Same goes for databases. Now you should definitely know some PostgreSQL and some NoSQL along with some SQL, of course, because SQL is the most commonly used. But as an ethical hacker, you'll be working with these three types of databases. So it would be pretty helpful to know all these types of languages like MySQL is a must. Then also knowing some bash scripting because you'll be working on Linux and most of the times you'll be tinkering around with tools and you'll be trying to customize them to meet your own needs. So you should learn all sorts of programming if you're trying to become an ethical hacker because there is no single language that you'll be working on. Now, where else is programming actually used when ethical hacking? Many people ask me after asking what programming language should I use there? Why should I learn programming when I'm doing ethical hacking? Now, let me just try and explain that. Now, firstly, hackers are the problem solvers and tool builders of the company and learning how to program will help you implement the solutions to problems that you find in the company's security. Now it also differentiates you from script kiddies who actually use pre-made tools to actually hack into systems. So those are the people who are just practicing hacking and they already use pre-made tools like Metasploit and MITMF frameworks to actually pull off some hacking gimmicks. Now writing programs as a hacker will also help you automate many of the tasks which would usually take a lot of your time to complete. So time saved is money made. And thirdly, writing programs can also help you identify and exploit programming errors in applications that you will be targeting. Now, last but not the least, you don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time. There are a number of open source programs that are readily usable out there, but it is always useful that you can customize already existing applications and add your own methods to suit your needs. And that would be impossible if you had no idea of how to program. So there you go. I gave you four very good reasons as to why you should learn programming as an ethical hacker or person who is trying to pursue ethical hacking as a career. Now let's go over the different types of tools that ethical hackers use on a day-to-day -day basis. So the first tool that we are going to talk about is NetSparker. Now NetSparker is an easy to use web application security scanner that can automatically find SQL injections, cross-site scriptings and other vulnerabilities in your web application and web services. 
and it is available as an on-premise and a software as a service solution. Now its features include dead accurate vulnerability detection with unique proof-based scanning technology. It is also known for its minimal configuration required. The scanner automatically detects the URL, rewrites rules, custom 404 error pages. Then is the REST API for seamless integration with the SDLC bug tracking. And it is also a fully scalable solution. It can scan 1000 web applications in just 24 hours. Okay, so the next tool that we're gonna be talking about is Burpsuit. Now Burpsuit is a useful platform for performing security testing of web applications. Its various tools work seamlessly together to support the entire penetration testing process. It spans from initial mapping to analysis of an application's attack surface. Now its features are that it can detect over 3000 web application vulnerabilities. It can scan open source softwares and custom built application. It has an easy to use login sequence recorder and allows the automatic scanning. And it can also be used for reviewing vulnerability data with built in vulnerability management. It also easily provides wide variety of technical and compliance reports, and it can also be used for detecting critical vulnerabilities with 100% accuracy. It can be used for automated crawl and scan, advanced scanning features for manual testers, and it is also a cutting edge scanning logic. Now the next tool that we're going to be talking about is Nmap. Now Nmap is a reconnaissance tool. Now reconnaissance is the first phase of ethical hacking. So in reconnaissance, we are actually trying to gather all the information and Nmap is a brilliant tool for doing that. It can tell you about the domain name server. It can tell you how a packet is actually reaching the target system. It can determine what kind of an operating system the target system is using, which is basically footprinting. It can also do some very basic fingerprinting that is trying to figure out how a packet reaches, which I just said. What is the server information? Like when was the server created? Whose name is the server under? Where is the server located? So all sorts of information gathering stuff. Nmap is a brilliant tool. Now the next tool that we're going to talk about that ethical hackers use on a daily basis is Acunetics. Now Acunetics is a fully automated ethical hacking solution that mimics a hacker to keep one step ahead of malicious intruders. The web application security scanner accurately scans HTML5, JavaScript and single page applications. It can audit complex authenticated web apps and issue compliance and management reports on a wide range of web and network vulnerabilities. Its features include the following. Firstly, it can scan for all variants of SQL injection, cross site scripting and around 4500 additional vulnerabilities. Also, it detects over 1200 WordPress core themes and plugin vulnerabilities. It is fast and scalable and crawls hundreds and thousands of pages without any sort of interruption. It integrates with popular WAFs and issue trackers to aid in the SDLC process. And it is always available on premise as a cloud solution. Okay, now the next tool that we're going to talk about is Hashcat. Now Hashcat is a robust password cracking ethical hacking tool. It can help users to recover lost passwords audit password security, or just find out what data is stored in a hash. Its features include that it is open source platform. It is also cross platform. It allows utilizing multiple devices in the same system. It can utilize mixed device types in the same system. It supports distributed cracking networks, and it also supports interactive pause and resume. It supports session and restore, and there's also a built in benchmarking system. And it also integrates thermal watchdogs and supports automatic performance tuning. And okay, so the last tool that we're going to be talking about that ethical hackers use almost on a lazy basis is called SQL Map. Now, SQL Map automates the process of detecting and exploiting SQL injection weaknesses. It is open source and cross platform, and it supports the following databases. So it supports MySQL, Oracle, PostgreSQL, MS SQL servers, MS Access, IBM DB2, SQL Lite, Firebird, Sybase, and a lot of other database types. It also supports the following SQL injection types. So these are Boolean based blinds, time based blinds, error based, union query, and stacked queries and out of bands. So these are some of the tools that are being used by ethical hackers on a daily basis to do their job. Okay, now moving on. Let's talk about social engineering. So what exactly is social engineering? Now social engineering is the art of manipulating a user or a bunch of users of a computing system into revealing confidential information 
that can be used to gain unauthorized access to a computer system. The term can also include activities such as exploiting human kindness, greed and curiosity to gain access to restricted access buildings or getting the user to installing backdoor software. Knowing the tricks used by hackers to trick users into releasing vital login information among others is the fundamental in protecting computer system. Now social engineering is a very widely used process. So as an ethical hacker, you should know what is exactly social engineering and how it is done. So basically social engineering is manipulating people as I just said and you must all know that people are very easy to manipulate in this world because one they contain emotions and secondly emotions can wave on from one form to the other. One day you're sad the other day you're happy and a hacker very well knows how to actually manipulate you into giving out your information based on whether you're happy or sad. So as an ethical hacker, it is very important for him to educate his organization's people on how to not get social engineered and giving up their social credentials. So this is why I've included the topic of social engineering. Now let's go over the phases of social engineering. So social engineering is divided into five distinct phases and they form a cycle. So this cycle is generally used by hackers when they're performing social engineering on you. So you as, a, as an ethical hacker should also know these five steps. So first step is gathering information. Now this is the first step and the hacker learns as much as he can about the intended victim. The information is gathered from company websites, other publications and sometimes by talking to the user of the target system in itself. The next part is actually planning your attack. Now the attacker outlines how he or she is intending to attack the target victim depending on the information that he has gathered from the first phase. Now after the person has decided how you are going to be attacked, he is going to try and acquire all the tools to attack you. So these include computer programs that an attacker will be using when launching the attack. So this can be something as simple as Metasploit to something as complex as a fully catered ethical hacker built penetration testing tool. Now the fourth part is actually performing the attack. So the weaknesses that have been found through all the information gathering is attacked on with the tools that have also been gathered. Now the information gathered during the social engineering tactics such as pet names, birth dates of organization, founders and all sorts of information is used in attacks such as password guessing. So after the information is gained, the cycle keeps going on and on and even more crucial information is passed down to the hacker. Now social engineering techniques can take many forms. Now these are the forms that you will normally see. So first is the familiarity exploit. Now users are less suspicious of people they are familiar with. That's normal human tendency. An attacker can familiarize him or herself with the users of the target system prior to the social engineering attack. And now the attacker may interact with the user during meals when the user probably goes out for a smoke break and he or she may join on social events while they're out for a drink and something like that. This makes the attacker familiar to the user. And let's suppose that the user works in a building that requires an access code or card to gain access. Now the attacker may follow the user as they enter such places and the users are most likely to hold the door open for the attacker to go in as they are familiar with them. Now the attacker can also ask for answers to questions such as where you met your spouse or the name of your high school math teacher and the users are most likely to reveal the answer as they trust the familiar face. This information could be later on used to hack email accounts, other accounts that ask similar questions if one forgets their password. Now the second technique is an intimidating circumstance. Now people tend to avoid people who intimidate others around them. Using this technique, the attacker may pretend to have a heated argument on the phone or with an accomplice in the scheme. The attacker may then ask the user for the information which would be used to compromise the security of the user system. The users are most likely to give the correct answer just to avoid having a confrontation with the attacker. This technique can also be used to avoid being checked at a security checkpoint. Now the third kind is phishing. Now this technique uses trickery and deceit to obtain private data from users. The social engineer may try to impersonate a genuine website such as Yahoo or Facebook and then ask the unsuspecting user to confirm their account name and password. This technique could also be used to get credit card information or any other valuable personal data. Now, the next form is tailgating. 
This technique involves following the users behind as they enter restricted areas. As a human curtsy, the user is most likely to let the social engineer inside the restricted area. And the third one is, of course, human curiosity and emotions as a whole. Using this technique, the social engineer may deliberately drop a virus infected flash disk in an area where the users can easily pick it up. The user will most likely plug the flash disk into the computer and the flash disk may contain auto running viruses or the user may be tempted to open a file with a name such as the employer re-evaluation report, which may actually be an infected file. And above this, human greed is also a major thing in social engineering. Many people are lured in by making promises such as I'll give you so much money if you click this link or you can win a game and win so much money, which is just general forms of social engineering to get your credentials or cookies. Now, there are a bunch of countermeasures that you can take. Now, these are pretty obvious, but let's just discuss them because we have quite a lot of time. So to counter the familiarity exploit, the user must be trained not to substitute familiarity with security measures. Even the people that they are familiar with must prove that they have the authorization to access certain areas and information. To counter intimidating circumstances, users must be trained to identify social engineering techniques that fish for sensitive information and politely say no. Thirdly, to counter phishing techniques, most sites such as Yahoo use secure connections to encrypt data and prove that they are the ones who they claim to be. Checking the URL may help you spot fake websites and avoiding responding to emails that request you to provide personal information. Now to counter tailgating, users must be trained not to let others users use their security clearance to gain access to restricted areas. Each user must use their own access for clearance at all times. And human emotions can be helped as we all know, humans are stupid and there's no helping human stupidity, but still, as a general rule of thumb, never reply to any Nigerian or any African guy that is asking you for money because you just felt to kind one simple day. Okay, so those were the types of social engineering. Now, as ethical hacker, you will be dealing with a lot of cryptography. So I've also included cryptography in this tutorial. So let's go over what exactly is cryptography. Now, information plays a vital role in running businesses, organizations, military operations, and such. Information in the wrong hands can lead to loss of business or catastrophic results. Now, to secure communication, a business can use cryptology to cipher information. Cryptology involves transferring information into non-human readable formats and vice versa. Now, let us discuss what is cryptography. So, cryptography is the study and application of techniques that hide the real meaning of information by transforming it into non-human readable formats and vice versa. So let me just try and illustrate how cryptography looks like. So suppose we have some text that says, I love apples. Now, if you were to use some cryptographic algorithm that actually encrypts this text by actually shifting the letters by two, it would look something like this. So I would turn into K and L would turn to N, O would turn into Q, V into Y, and you would have something what we call in the computing world as ciphertext. Now, ciphertext is confusing and it is almost impossible to understand if you don't really know the key. But as an ethical hacker, your job will be mostly turning ciphertext into plain text without actually knowing the key. Now, that is exactly what is called as cryptoanalysis or cryptanalysis. So cryptanalysis is the art of trying to decrypt the encrypted messages without the use of the key that was used to encrypt the messages. Cryptanalysis uses mathematical analysis and algorithms to decipher the ciphers. And the success of cryptanalysis attacks depends on the amount of time available, the computing power available, and the storage capacity available. Now, let's go over the types of cryptanalysis techniques or the techniques that are used to break into cipher text. So, the first technique that is used for deciphering text is a brute force attack. Now, this type of attack uses algorithms that try to guess all the possible logical combination of the plain text, which are then ciphered and compared against the original cipher. Second kind is dictionary attacks. Now, this type of attack uses a word list in order to find a match of either the plain text or key. It is mostly used when trying to crack encrypted passwords. Now, the third kind is called a rainbow table attack. And this type of attack compares the ciphertext against pre-computed hashes to find matches. So basically you have a table of hashes and you're constantly comparing your given hash to the hash you're trying to find. Now let's also discuss the different types of cryptographic algorithms that have been developed over time. 
the first algorithm that we are going to discuss about is MD5. Now, MD5 is an acronym for Message Digest 5. It is used to create 128-bit hash values, and theoretically speaking, hashes cannot be reversed into original plain text. And MD5 is used to encrypt passwords as well as check data integrity. MD5 is not collision resistance, and collision resistance is the difficulty in finding two values that produce the same hash values. Now, the second type of algorithm is SHA, which stands for Secure Hashing Algorithm. Now, SHA algorithms are used to generate condensed representations of messages, and these are called digests. It has various versions, such as SHA-0, which produced a 128-bit hash value. It was withdrawn from use due to significant flaws and replaced by SHA-1. Now, SHA-1 produces 160-bit hash values, and it is similar to the earlier versions of MD5 and it has cryptographic weaknesses and is not recommended for use after the year 2010. Then we have SHA-2. It has two hash functions, namely SHA-256 and SHA-512. SHA-256 uses 32-bit words, while SHA-512 uses 64-bit words. Then is SHA-3, and this algorithm was formerly known as KCCAK, and is widely used in the validation process in Ethereum, if you know what that is. Now, the third kind of algorithm is RC4 and this stands for riveting cipher 4 and this algorithm is used to create stream ciphers it is mostly used in the protocols such as ssl which stands for secure socket layer and to encrypt internet communication using wep which stands for wired equivalent privacy to secure wireless networks okay now this brings us to the theoretical end of our ethical hacking tutorial now it's time for some hacktivity so for today's hacktivity we will create a simple cipher using RT4 algorithm, and we will then attempt to decrypt it using brute force attack. For this exercise, I'm gonna assume that we know the encryption key is 24 bits, and we will use this information to break the cipher. Now for this, we are gonna be using the software called Cryptool, and I already have that downloaded. I'll leave the download link in the description. Y'all can download it and follow with me as we are performing this activity. So firstly, open Cryptool 1 and replace the text that you see. Now, we can replace the text with whatever we want. So I'm going to be replacing it with some random text, like never underestimate the determination of a kid who is, let's say, time rich and cash poor. Now, that's one of my favorite quotes, and we are going to try and encrypt this. So firstly, we are going to try and encrypt this. For that, click on the encrypt and decrypt menu and point to symmetric modern. Now in symmetric modern, you will find RC4. So we will be trying to actually encrypt it using RC4. So let us put the key length as 24 bits. So we already know that. And the value has been set to 0000. Now all you have to do is click the encrypt button and you will get the following stream cipher. So this is your cipher text. So as an ethical hacker, you will be more interested in the analysis of the ciphertext rather than the creation of the ciphertext. So as an ethical hacker, you will need to analyze the ciphertext and try and decipher what is the plain text that is hiding behind this. So to do this using Cryptool, you can go into the analysis part and then go into symmetric encryption and modern. Now here, all you have to select is the algorithm that is used. Now the assumption that we made is that it is going to be 24-bit key length. So we can always assume that. And all we have to do is start analyzing. And what this will do is run a brute force search on this entire cipher text. Now, depending on your computer's computing power, this can take some time. Now it's showing one hour and 32 minutes. So let me just actually let this run and show you what it's gonna look like. Now, as you guys can see here, our brute force attack has been completed. It took quite some time, but our results are out here. So our result is divided into these four columns. So first is the entropy. The second is the hex dump. That is the hex that was analyzed. Now the third part is the part that we are interested in. So this is the cipher or the deciphered text that we got from the cipher text. And these are the keys that were used to actually decrypt them. 
So when the key for, or rather C19334 was used, this is the decrypted text that we got. Now, all these makes no sense, but just to actually identify what probable plain text is to a certain cipher text, always look for the entropy. Now, out here, this has the lowest entropy, that is 4.0001. And as we can see, that it is indeed the sentence that I had typed out. Never underestimate the determination of a kid who is time rich and cash poor. So this actually shows us how RC4, that is a brilliant cryptographic algorithm that is used in SSL and WEP can be so easily broken with a brute force analysis. And these tools are widely available for a general user like me or you to use. So this brings us to the end of the hacktivity that I spoke about. And this also brings us to the end of this ethical hacking tutorial. I hope you guys had a wonderful time learning the various factors of ethical hacking like cryptography, social engineering, the phases of ethical hacking and all these such. Please don't forget to watch my other video, which is what is ethical hacking. I have actually made a beginner's video as to what ethical hacking is and how ethical hacking actually works. And we at Edureka also have an ethical hacking course, which is aligned to the CH version 10. That is the Certified Ethical Hacker Certification version 10. If you buy this course, you will actually be learning from a certified ethical hacker all about ethical hacking and it'll be a live instructor led session. So hang on guys, we are gonna be releasing a lot of more free content regarding ethical hacking, but that's it for today, goodbye.